you go. Now, thank you, Rob. I must stay. So I'm going to build on the uh, nice framework that Keith just laid out in terms of rigor, in posing the right question, dis figuring out what is the appropriate study design, the power that you need to be able to answer the question as posed. And really what I'm going to talk ab about is the additional elements that relate primarily to the word bias that um, Keith uh, raised. Because studies are measured in terms of quality, not just in terms of the appropriate statistical design of their study, but in terms of bias. And when we get move into systematic reviews, it is the quality of study beyond study design that is often <coughs> one of the major issues, one of the major problems in whether or not a study is included in a systematic review of the kind that then Alan, spelt with two L's, will um, go run through for us. Now, this is important because data numbers um, relate not just to researchers, not just to academics. Data frame political debates. They frame dialogue. They frame the whole world around us. Data are of all kinds are part of the public discourse. And some of you may know and may have even read this uh, bestseller. Uh, recently by Thomas Piketty, who published early uh, in the summer, uh, an, a French economist who pushed uh, the debate globally forward on inequality. Uh, may this, this book is all about the, the, what he argues is the rise of income inequality uh, within countries and across countries, and that this in itself poses a challenge, a threat even, to the fabric of society. And this has been a very, very influential, a very data-driven piece of work by an economist that has framed a major argument. But even that solid, argued, well-framed piece of work is not, um, is, is open to criticism. And the criticisms typically relate to bias. So we have the Financial Times, we had the Wall Street Journal, we had a lot of conservative commentators saying, oh, but no, the argument must be wrong because his data are flawed. The way he uses data isn't right. And even uh, the, uh, the Financial Times said w they launched an investigation. This is the Financial Times, launched an investigation into the unexplained data entries and errors in the figures. Now, why would the Financial Times launch an investigation into the data presented in a book that is published by an author simply to make a case? Well, the reason is because they want to challenge that case. And there are lots of ways that one can do that. There is always going to be, uh, and you're always going to be open to certain kinds of challenges of bias. And the Financial Times, through this investigation, argued that there were multiple unexplained adjustments. Unexplained, which relates to the word transparency that Keith talked about. Data entries with no source sourcing, which relates to the word documentation that Keith used. Unexplained use of different time periods, in inconsistent uses of source sources of data. So the Financial Times essentially did a hatchet job, actually went in after uh, Piketty and said, look, look at all these holes in the data. Therefore, we cannot trust not just the data, but the argument itself. Right? So this understanding how to avoid or minimize, you can never avoid, but you can certainly try to minimize the threat of being challenged on the basis of these kinds of problems, lack of transparency, lack of documentation, bias in your choices of, of time periods and data. This is something that researchers need to be fully aware of. Now I'm gonna just give a bit of uh, example relating to uh, wasting, okay? So we've talked a lot about in the last couple of days about agriculture, about food <coughs> and diets and stunting, but I just want to point out that the World Health Assembly, just a couple of years ago, which is the governing body of the uh, World Health Organization, agreed what they call a comprehensive uh, plan for maternal and child nutrition and defined and agreed across the world 
six different targets to be met by 2025, yes, of course, it includes stunting, reduction of stunting by 40%, but also includes getting wasting, child wasting in children under five below 5%, a prevalence rate of 5% in every country in the world. Right? So in addition to stunting, anemia, birth weight, uh, overweight is there, so obesity is, is a concern. But we're going to focus just on this issue of wasting, which seems like a small number, mine is getting it down to 5%, but it's not a small number. Now globally, the most recent, um, the Global Nutrition Report, which just literally came out last week, and you can find that online, the Global Nutrition Report. It's a massive piece of work that everyone should uh, have access to and, and read through carefully notes that globally, wasting in children under five, which is low um, weight for height, uh, at 8%, but as we saw in the recent DHS in Nepal, the average is about 11%, so in double digits. And in some parts, in particularly in the Terai, as we saw in some of the presentations yesterday, well over 20%, and sometimes up to 25%. Not just the Terai, there are pockets higher up as well. So that, is quite a challenge. If we're going to try and bring those pockets in the Terai at 25% down below 5% means that we've got to do some targeted action, not just on stunting, but specifically on wasting. And there are a lot of countries that need this. Uh, Nepal is among the countries where wasting is either at a constant level, not moving, or decreasing. Um, there are 76 countries in that group where wasting has either been coming down or pretty much static, and Nepal is one of those where it's just been static over the last decade or so, and 15, 51 countries where wasting is actually increasing. Even in countries where stunting is decreasing, wasting is increasing. So this is a global problem that not enough people have been talking about, I would argue. It doesn't mean that focus on 1,000 days and stunting isn't important, but this is equally important. And it does mean that we need to understand what to do about it. Right? So that's just framing uh, that particular question. But the question of what to do about it is pretty wide open. There are a lot of concerns about a lack of evidence. So this comes straight to what Keith was talking about. Lack of rigorous evidence that tells us what to do about it. About it. We know where it is, we know what it is, but how do we, how do we um, deal with it? Some of it relates to humanitarian response. Uh, a lot of wasting you find in emergencies, but just as much wasting is found outside of emergencies as in the Terai of, um, of Nepal. So we have recent commentators saying, well, the evidence base on how to deal with wasting in emergencies is extremely lacking. There's others saying there's a dearth or a darth, I can never remember how you pronounce that, dearth or darth, I, I think it's a dearth of evidence no, oh, okay, it's a dearth of evidence um, on a range of topics relating to the community management of acute malnutrition. And that the types of research currently published fail to answer adequately the questions posed, which is exactly what Keith was saying. If we're not answering the questions, then that research is, is um, well, fails most of the standards of rigor from the outset. Right, so we're at a point where we don't have much evidence on what works in, a de in dealing with wasting. That was up to about 2010. Then suddenly, everyone woke up to this problem and started doing systematic reviews. Now, systematic reviews, as you'll hear from Alan, represent a codified, a structured approach to sifting through published and sometimes unpublished evidence to determine what do we have, what can we deem rigorous evidence, what can we consider to be most appropriate. Now these are recent systematic reviews that have all been done in one way or another relating to wasting. SAM means severe acute malnutrition, so severe wasting, minus three Z scores uh, for uh, weight for height. MAM means moderate acute wasting, so it's mild and moderate wasting, less than minus two uh, standard deviations. <laughs> And most of them deal with different kinds of interventions, different kinds of foods, mainly ready-to-use therapeutic foods and ready-to-use supplementary foods. Plumpy nut is, the, is the, the famous one that most people have heard of, but there are other kinds of foods, other kinds of treatments, sometimes simply behavior change communication, 
sometimes grain-based foods, and so on. So there's been a, a lot of systematic reviews, at least these six, there actually are a couple more. But let's say there have been six systematic reviews in the last few years. Now one could argue that a systematic review then should essentially come up with the same findings because it's come up with the same papers because it's followed a structured approach. And I guess what I'm pointing out here is that not all systematic reviews are the same because they set different criteria for the review. They set different criteria in terms of what, are, what kinds of trials, what kinds of, of um, studies are interviewed, are included. Some only include randomized controlled trials. Some go beyond randomized controlled trials to include clinical controlled trials and even prospective respect, uh, retrospective case control. Some include controlled before and after. Some actually include interrupted time series. Some actually put no restriction whatsoever on the, the, the types of studies included. Now we saw that pyramid that Alan will show again on the, the quality of evidence and the, the, the how valuable it is in terms of bias, in terms of framing the question, in terms of how we can use it uh, to, to determine rigor. But what you can see here, these are all framed as systematic reviews, but they're all using a different subsets of studies in that on-study design. And there are different, uh, different approaches to assessing quality. A lot of, um, the, the, the many of you have heard of the Cochrane review process, which is one of several approaches to defining how one should determine quality uh, of evidence. And whether there was uh, selection bias, whether there was uh, reporting bias, whether there was detection bias, whether there was bias in the allocation of treatment, all of these things need to be understood individually within the studies. Right? So it's not just study design, it's actually the biases that are either acknowledged or avoided within the studies that matter. And w which is the pointer? Is it the top, the top one? These are just, let's say, uh, three, six, nine studies that were included in one of the systematic reviews. And once, let's say, those nine studies are then looked at by multiple researchers, and they basically grade them according to these different standards. This is, in this case, there are seven standards, uh, often used by the Cochrane Review. Others use more than this or less than this. But according to this study, let's say, Brazil in 2006, um, came out well in six of those assessments. You know, it meets the standards of, of high quality in six, but actually we're not sure about the seventh. We're not sure about the selection bias in terms of random sequence generation. So was there randomization involved? And they don't know because it's not in the published paper and or they couldn't contact the author and or the author wouldn't respond and tell them with the right kind of information. Right? A lot of systematic reviews chase the authors. They don't simply stop at the data themselves. Now, there are other cases where uh, this particular study, way, a lot of question marks. Uh, I'm sorry, that actually doesn't gender, engender a lot of confidence when there's so many question marks. And this study, well, we've got one positive, we've got three question marks, and we've got three negatives. And it's like, well, hmm. How are we going to trust that? And so simply uh, assessing the b potential biases I within these studies is a major um, issue. And the more studies you include, the more of this um, traffic light coloring you're going to find. So one systematic review managed to include all of these different studies, and there are some. There are some that are green all the way along. There are some that are mainly green with just maybe one uh, yellow question mark. And in the end, these also serve as means of excluding papers from the systematic review. Right? They simply, if, they, if you cannot trust or you don't have enough information to make an assessment on the quality or the biases, then I'm sorry, even famous studies have to be rejected. And right now, high risk and unclear risk appears in far too, too, far too many systematic reviews. Once you start reading the systematic reviews, 
that are collated under the Cochrane Review website or the DFID evidence website or just published as systematic reviews, you'll find the words high risk and unclear risk or unclear bias far too often, even in publications that get published and even those that are widely cited. And this is a big, big problem. We need, this is why we, we're here today to say we really need to do better both to avoid the biases and to be more transparent about the potential quality issues involved in even the famous studies that many of us cite. Now, if reviewers can't get full answers about the sources of, of uh, bias from the paper, from the authors, then you just can't have confidence in the results. So that this is a case where you, you can't just let the data tell you what the data says. The data only tell you what you can trust. And this is exactly Rolf's point about these data are not coming from God, they're coming from people. We can't trust them if there are just too many question marks. And there are all kinds of biases. Uh, we talked about selection bias, there's bias in, in, in treatment. You have to be absolutely sure that the people you're comparing with other people uh, can, can be compared, they are comparable, that the treatment is randomized, that um, subpopulations weren't systematically excluded somehow, um, the mis that findings were completely reported, no cherry picking, no, no avoiding of bad results, no avoiding of missing values and, and trying to manipulate the data in ways that make your outcome more publishable. Um, all of these are, uh, are problematic and in way, sorry, in publications, whoops, sorry, publications on wasting, lack of data relating to default rates, people who lost a follow-up, relapse rates and so on, is often lacking. All they present is how many people were cured versus not cured. And that, that doesn't tell you the whole picture. And so you cannot have confidence in a particular trial if you don't have the full evidence. Uh, selective reporting, and then um, potential um, protection against contamination, leakage effects of the trial intervention itself. Are we really, really sure that the control group, the comparator group, did not get access to the information or the inputs from the trial group? Uh, and if they did, we have to be transparent about it. So there are a lot of sources of potential bias and quality um, manipulation. Now, I just want to point out, I don't know if Alan is going to use this. I don't think so, but uh, uh, Alan was part of a DFID review that um, looked at, not at wasting in this case, but uh, agriculture-based interventions to, uh, to impact on nutrition outcomes, a recent um, evidence-based paper that was based on systematic review. And what I really liked about uh, this paper, which is also online, is the clarity with which they lay out the inclusion and exclusion criteria and the assessment of quality, the assessment of bias. So here it's very clear what, the dis what kinds of studies were included or excluded. So anything that was, uh, everything that was excluded that was experimental and non-experimental that did not have a comparison group was not part of the systematic review. That's transparent, it's absolutely clear. No comparison, sorry, you're you don't make it. If you want to be included, make sure you've got a comparator group. It's that simple. But what I really like is this very simple way of going through a paper, any paper, not just a systematic review, and assessing quality along these uh, parameters. Conceptual framing, does it construct, is it based on theory? Is it a theory-based construct? Um, does it outline a hypothesis that can be tested directly? Um, do, do, does the author explicitly recognize limitations and weaknesses? Is it completely transparent about possible alternative interpretations or weaknesses in study design or in the approach? And these can be just yes and no. You could use this kind of template to ass assess any paper that you look at as a student, as, a, as an instructor, and go through these and determine where, just how confident you feel in the value, the rigor, the quality of the evidence of that paper. Validity is their measurement, internal and external validity, re reliability, and cogency. Are, are the conclusions, finally, finally, are the conclusions and the abstract really, truly based 
on the content of the analysis. It's amazing how many times recently, as a reviewer, where I've seen something claimed in the abstract that is absolutely not present in the rest of the text. And it's the abstract that a lot of people just skim through and read, and then they actually find, you then read the paper and you find out it wasn't even there. Right, so that's a poor, that's a problem with the review process and editorial process, but it's, it's also uh, a reminder, don't just read the abstracts. So this kind of simple assessment of quality uh, is very, very useful. Now what systematic, coming back again to systematic reviews, those that do then go through this process, they often start out looking, reviewing, and coming up with 7,000 potential papers, and you exclude these because they have no comparator group, and you exclude those because the study design wasn't appropriate, and you come down to 23 papers, or seven papers, in this particular six papers. And in fact, on wasting, uh, it's, w it's a strange truth uh, that there are more systematic reviews on the treatment of wasting than there are studies that can be included in systematic reviews on wasting. I hope that's going to change, but anyway, there are only about six or seven credible studies on the treatment of wasting, and every one of those systematic reviews relies on them, but they come up with some common uh, results and some not so common. Many uh, go the next step to pooling data, doing meta-analysis, not all, but some do. They actually, if they can come up with credible, rigorous data sets, they can pool them and generate um, estimates that are, and then use forest plots to demonstrate on which side uh, of, the, of the line are you. Uh, if you're on one side, it, uh, the, the results favor one particular type of intervention. If you're on the other side, favors the other type of intervention. And a lot of these studies are testing uh, a lipid-based ready-to-use food versus either some other intervention, just behavior change uh, communication, or a cereal-based uh, product and so on. So it's really just an either or in many of these instances. And these are very useful uh, in demonstrating the power or the consistency or the commonality of findings. The problem is, as I say, with wasting, there are very few that you can compare. So in this case, uh, most studies, in fact, all of these studies, these three studies favor ready-to-use therapeutic foods versus a standard therapy. So that these are strong findings, relatively strong findings. They're pretty robust, but they're very few, and that's a problem. So despite what I showed you about different inclusion factors, different kinds of studies being included in the systematic review, different time frames for those reviews, different approaches, they're actually very similar reviews across the six studies that are essentially uh, telling us what works in the treatment of man. And those findings are, just in a quick summary form, food supplements do work in the treatment of both moderate acute and severe acute malnutrition. Well, that's good because that's what we use. So uh, a post hoc, actually what's happened is people started using ready-to-use therapeutic foods a decade before there was ever any trials to prove that they actually work. So now we, at least now we can confirm they do work. Uh, the thing is, lipid type supplements, ready-to-use lipid foods, are s a little bit better than fortified blended foods, grain-based foods, still micronutrient fortified, in terms of weight gain and recovery rate. So they get you there faster, they get you uh, to the threshold of, of required weight gain to recovery from wasting, and the recovery rate is slightly faster. It is sig statistically significant, but only slightly significant. But what's interesting is that these studies, these six or seven studies, find non-significant difference with between these various foods in terms of ultimately mortality, default, progression out of or relapse rates back into wasting, all right? So you can't just say in a blanket sense, lipids are better because they're better at some things, but they're clearly not better than other things. And so that's good. That's what we're finding from this kind of systematic review about um, wasting. All of them, pretty much all of those systematic reviews can conclude with these kind of caveats. A, there are too few studies to allow confident generalization. Okay, so although we've got some pretty strong, robust outcomes, 
we're told you can't generalize from these because we simply have too few studies. Wow, okay, then we better do some more studies. That's, that's what you need to do. Uh, there are too few studies outside of essentially Malawi and Niger. There's essentially only two countries in the world where most of these studies have been conducted. Are they representative of the rest of the world? Do they represent what the Terai looks like? Yeah, probably not. Right? So we need more studies outside of these two locations in the world. The quality of evidence, even in all of these systematic reviews, they conclude the quality of evidence is most often low or at least unclear. And this is unacceptable. We really, at this day and age, should never be accused of having un unclear, but certainly not <coughs> low quality of evidence. This is something that has to be dealt with going forward. And the other part is that heterogeneity within the data sets often, allow, often prevent meta-analysis and pooling of data or subgroup analysis. There's so much heterogeneity in the populations that are being um, looked at that we can't actually delve deeper into the data. And so we're, we're constrained in that sense and cannot do meta-analyses. Sources of those heterogeneity should also be avoided. The, the main sources of heterogeneity across those systematic reviews are different, different definitions, different ways of measuring wasting. I feel like saying, come on guys, let's get our act together. Different definitions, all right. If you're going to use different definitions, at least make multiple, use multiple measurements using all the definitions so we can compare. But different studies use different types of definitions, different cutoffs, different thresholds for what <coughs> defines recovery, um, s different skill sets, the, the standardization that Keith talked about, different types of people, actual researchers versus rural health post clinicians. Doesn't mean, you know, that I'm not dissing them, but they have different standards of training and standardization and lots of missing data, lots of metrics not reported. Right, so even though we've got half a dozen good systematic reviews with robust evidence, there's all these caveats that are still there. And we should be <coughs> avoiding these. The actual quotable conclusions from those systematic reviews, not possible to reach definiti definitive conclusions from these results. Limited details of study metho methods affect generalizability. Difficult to reach firm conclusions. Gaps in our ability to estimate effectiveness. Limitations in this evidence means that we can't really rely on it. Very important topic, and the conclusion is, ah, we don't know. That's pretty bad, all right? We have to fix this. We all of us have to address these concerns, not just in study design, but in quality, in the kind of evidence we uh, collect, the way we report the data, and uh, the generalizability of the findings. So I'm not going to go there. So final slide, what do we need to do? What do you need to do, not for conducting a systematic review, but for making sure that your next study could be included in a systematic review? And if it's not, then it's often seen as outside of the body of evidence. So you may, may do what you think is a wonderful study with wonderful impact, uh, wonderful findings, but it may not get included in the next systematic review because of X, and those, that X needs to be addressed. And it could be study design isn't convincing to the reviewers, uh, there was selective reporting, there was biases, data gaps, um, not enough detail to convince the reviewer, so those question marks, unclear, unclear results, uh, the over-interpretation of the findings, which means that people just really don't trust what you're saying, um, and not acknowledging the weaknesses, and that uh, the various different, the intervention group and the, the other intervention group and the comparator group were all not simply comparable to begin with. All of these things can be avoided. All of these things must be avoided going forward. Then we can start talking about raising the bar on the amount of rigorous evidence that is available for systematic review. Okay, thank you.